Let us confess our sins to God and share ourselves and may worthily participate in his holy sacrifice. This morning we gather for our second Sunday morning Mass. We had that early one that is recited. People love that. It's one and a half hour. There's no choir. There's no sermon. Uh, there's no music. And uh, so they, they love that for some reason. And I uh, hope it's not just there's no sermon, but uh, I think it's my son will come. So uh, but anyway, we had our first Mass this morning, and uh, now our second one. And then for anyone who would like, uh, we are going to our diocesan celebration up at the Cathedral of the Pines this afternoon, and that will be beginning at 3.30. And that's a continuation of uh, the diocese's celebration of the 150th birthday anniversary of Bishop Hoder, our organizer. And uh, Bishop Paul will be the principal celebrant, and Father Senior Joseph Pershansky of Plantsville, Connecticut, will be the homilist. And because of the weather, I'm not exactly sure if we'll be able to go outside to the altar of the nation and get that beautiful vista of all of those uh, New Hampshire mountains and valleys. It's, it's gorgeous. Uh, but because of the weather, we may have to be up in the chapel. Uh, so we won't be able to make that call until we get up there. Uh, but of course, any and all are invited. It's maybe a if you left here, I'd say give yourself an hour, 15, hour, 20 minutes, and you're there. It's a nice country ride, uh, no traffic or anything. So even if you decide, you know, after lunch, you want to go do something, you're more than welcome to go up there. Rain or shine, uh, the service of Mass will take place. Just not sure if it's outdoors or indoors. Uh, but as we do gather for this Mass, I ask you at this time to please make a private examination of your conscience. Take away the sins of the 
of heaven, we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. The lesson for this morning's Holy Mass is taken from the New Testament epistle to the Colossians. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or do dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making through the blood, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Here ends the lesson prescribed by the church for this moment morning's holy mass. Glory in his holy name. Rejoice, O hearts that seek the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come, let us join ourselves to the Lord with covenant everlasting. Never to be forgotten. Almighty and eternal God, who cleansed the lips of the prophet Isaiah with the word of God, cleanse my heart and my lips through, through your gracious mercy, that I may worthily proclaim your holy gospel through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord be my heart and on my lips, that I may worthily proclaim your holy gospel. Amen. The Lord be with you. Him as a carpenter. They watched the beginning of his ministry, 
And they knew him so much as a man. They knew him so much as, as a carpenter. They knew him so much as Joseph and Mary's kid that they couldn't see him as the image of the invisible God. And so that's why we hear from Jesus' mouth today those words, woe to you, because they couldn't get beyond the obvious and see the glorious nature of who Jesus is. You know, the word in the original text for image, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, is icon. And that's a Greek word, but maybe you've heard it before, icon. Icons are religious pictures, but they are specific kinds of religious pictures. And one of the most important attributes of an icon is the person who creates it. The images are considered to convey the holy. They're almost, in that sense, a sacrament. They, they actually, by looking at them, meditating on an icon, you, you start to touch that image, whether it be the Blessed Mother, whether it be Jesus, one of the saints. So they convey the holy. And because they convey the holy in that way, the artist, it is believed, has to be in a state of holiness him or herself. It's not only skill that defines an icon, it's the moral state of the art. A highly accomplished artist creating an absolutely beautiful piece of work, it would not pass the test of icon if that artist was leading an immoral life. They, the church just could not see how it was possible for a sinful person to be the, the instrument that would convey such holiness. So how can the holiness of an icon translate the holiness of the subject if the artist, him or herself, is not holy as well? I remember Bishop Paul telling me about the major renovations that were recently completed in our cathedral up in Manchester. The contractor does a lot of church work all over the country, and the crew keeps in mind that they are working in sacred spaces. Their language, therefore, is appropriate. You know, they're, they're guys working, they're, they're craftsmen, and they're inside a church, but their language is always appropriate. They're not blaring some kind of inappropriate, they're not even blaring music, period. They realize that they are working to create a space so that other people may worship, and that they are the instrument of creating that space, creating the opportunity for other people to be with God, and so they act accordingly. And likewise, there's a whole theology that deals with the idea of Jesus being an icon of God. This means that Jesus is the perfect representation of the Almighty. Jesus makes visible what is otherwise invisible. Jesus makes known what otherwise is absolutely unknowable. It means that what Jesus says, what Jesus does, is the very word of God and is the very living example of God. If you want to know what Jesus, if God would do, look at what Jesus does. If you want to know what God would say to you, look into the Bible and see what Jesus says. Now think about how important it is when Jesus says to those 72 disciples whom we talked about last Sunday, the ones who come out of nowhere in the gospel story, the ones who disappear just as quickly, those anonymous followers of Jesus, and they are the ones to whom Jesus says in this morning's gospel, whoever listens to you, listens to me. We are the 72. Whoever listens to us, says Jesus, listens to him. Jesus is the perfect, holy image of the invisible God. And we have all, not only the few with the collars, but all of us who are Christians have been given the sacred responsibility of painting the image for all who we encounter in what we say and in what we do of what Jesus says, what Jesus does, and therefore what God says and what God does. Just as the artist painting the icon or the craftsman working in the cathedral realizes that they are sharing the holy, so we too must realize that as believers, we have the privilege and responsibility of sharing Christ, even if we never, ever say his name. It's how we live, it's what we say, it's what we believe in, it's what we do. This isn't justification either for some kind of power trip. At one time, the church you know, abused this privilege of that we are God's presence in the world, and they treated almost along the lines of, you either listen to me or else. And the church has been accused of condemning more people to hell in the name of a living God because of that privilege and responsibility than any other institution in all of history. We had a loving God, and somehow the church through those years, especially the medieval years, they were throwing more people into hell and enjoying that thought than any other institution ever. In this way, the privilege of being Jesus' voice, his life, becoming nothing more than something that's a power grab, we lost the joy of being a follower of Jesus. 
In that search for power, there's none of the, the joy that we can hear coming out of that biblical hymn that Mariana read, read for us today. It celebrates Jesus as the image, the icon of God, and rejoices in creation. It rejoices in the church and that great promise that all things, everything, will be reconciled to God through him. One of Potter's favorite church fathers was Origen. And when he talked about the reconciliation of all things, he said everyone. If there is a hell, it's going to be empty at some point because he could not understand how an all-powerful, all-loving God could ever allow anyone to suffer in eternal hell. This is one of those beautiful passages that lets us hope in universal salvation, which is the very opposite of the theory of condemnation. It's that hope-filled theology that eventually, somehow, not because we deserve it, but because God is so loving that everything created by that kind of a God will, by the will of God, be reconciled to God through Christ. And that's the message we hear in today's liturgy from start to finish. The first words of today's particular map, we already read are, I lift up my soul to God, in you I trust. And the last words will be, help us to recognize that all people are our brothers and sisters. Enliven us, with help, enliven us as we help each other on the road to salvation. What a beautiful message then. Everybody's a brother and sister. God help us as we together walk that road to salvation. This is why the hymn sheet has that clip art picture of the word praise. And the letters A and I are depicted as a woman and a man with their arms raised in exultation. You know, too often people come to church and there's just no enthusiasm. It's just like, I gotta be there. But you know, the idea of coming to God's presence should be that idea of the hands and our arms raised up to God in joy. And that's also why we have included that drawing of Jesus looking heavenward. He's got such joy on his countenance that we are called upon to share God. It's not about power. It's not about judgment. It's not about condemnation. It should fill us instead with the joy and enthusiasm of having God so near. And then the world kicks us in the rear end and tests that faith. Almost every week, they are confronted with another tragic event that makes us say in exasperation, Oh my God. This week it was Minnesota, New Orleans, and then Dallas. I appreciate the apprehension of police officers today because there are so many guns out there in society. It could be the most casual of, of you know, pulling somebody over on the highway, but there are so many guns, those police officers don't know what that person behind the wheel is going to do. But I can also understand the anger and frustration among the African-American community that so many of their young men disproportionately are being killed by police action. One man was selling CDs outside a convenience store. Another had a broken tailor. Now they're both dead. But to then give vent to that rage by targeting randomly police officers in Dallas, that is simply vengeance at its worst. There's a picture in the immediate aftermath of the Dallas shooting of six distraught police officers. They were standing together outside of the hospital where the wounded officers had been shot and were transported there. They were together as police officers. Three of them were white and three of them were black. The Dallas shooter wasn't standing up for his race. Three of them were white, three of them were black. He was simply doing an injustice. He was only adding to the death tale. He wasn't helping his cause at all. What can maybe be a counter to all of this anger, to all of this violence, is possibly something as corny as love thy neighbor, and even forget about the love thy neighbor. It's neighbor. It's a conscious effort to get to know the other, so that they're not, for example, only some black guy behind a driver, behind a wheel, or a white cop, Instead, they are a person. And that's what brought all those protesters across the country together because of the personal stories that came out about these two men who were shot by the police. And that's what brought those officers together outside the hospital, black and white, because other police officers were in there. And that's why that memorial in Dallas is growing every day, because they start to see them as not officers, but as people. Jesus never ever looked upon another person by a category. He didn't say, oh, you're a Pharisee. Oh, you're a prostitute. Oh, you're a tax collector. 
He always saw the person behind the category. And Jesus says to us today, whoever listens to you, or listens to us, listens to me. So let us pray that we may share Jesus' message of neighbor by how we live, by always trying to see the person and not the category. And for this, may we pray in his most holy of names, so that this ridiculous cycle of violence and hatred may somehow come to an end. And for these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And in that same theme, I'd like to mention that uh, just this morning, Peg Project had, had asked that we, uh, we maybe take off the uh, recessional hint that is printed in your song sheet. And I think you may all know the, uh, the lyric, the words. Um, if you don't, you can just listen. But our recessional is going to be uh, let there be peace on earth. So that change was made just this morning. So I'm sorry, it's not in the song sheet, but I think you'll understand why we're saying it. Eternally begotten of the Father, Father of God, light from light, true God. 
confess through Jesus Christ our Lord. Through his cross and resurrection, he freed us from sin and death and called us to the glory that has made us a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people set apart. Everywhere we proclaim your mighty words, for you have called us out of darkness into your own wonderful light. Therefore the angels and archangels, with all the saints in the entire church, we lift our hymn of praise to your glory, repeating unceasingly. Shall be shed for the forgiveness of sins. As 
as often as you shall do these things, do them in remembrance of me. Wherefore, mindful of the Lord, we your servants, as also your faithful people, in remembrance of this Christ, your Son and our Lord, as also his blessed passion, resurrection, and his glorious ascension, we receive from your own gifts and presents a pure offering, a holy offering, an immaculate offering, the holy bread of eternal life, and the chalice of eternal salvation. These gifts we receive with a joyful countenance, as from him who is the giver of all temporal and eternal good gifts with an unshakable faith that they will become for our souls a saving remedy. We humbly beseech you, Almighty God, to command that our prayers be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your highest altar before the countenance of your divine majesty. That as many of us, as receiving the salt of the most sacred body and blood of your Son, may be filled with every blessing and grace through Christ our Lord. Amen. Be mindful also, Lord, of your servants and handmaidens, all who have gone before us with the sign of faith, and who have passed on to eternity. These souls, O Lord, is also to those who have died in Christ, grant everlasting life. And to those who during life stray from the path of righteousness, unmindful of your Father's love, mercifully short their sufferings, we beseech you, in the name of Christ our Lord and your beloved Son. And grant us, your sinful servants, who hope for the greatness of your mercy, some part in fellowship with your holy apostles, martyrs, and all your saints, who shed their blood for your name's sake, whose hearts were always open to justice and mercy, and whose lives patterned after the divine Master, merited eternal bliss. Number us, O Lord, in their company, with confidence we ask it, not because of our merit, but that you bestow forgiveness through Christ our Lord, by whom, O Lord, these gifts you always create, sanctify, revive, bless, and bestow upon us all these good things. Through him, and with him, and in him, and to you, God, the Father, the Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor, in all glory. Throughout all ages. 
Which shall I return unto the Lord for all the graces that he has rendered unto me? I will take the chalice of salvation, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. With high praise I will call upon the Lord, and I shall be saved from all my enemies. May the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ preserve my soul unto life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. 
body and the blood pressure. The body and the blood pressure. Pleasing to you, O Holy 
the Trinity and grant that the sacrifice which I, though unworthy, have offered up in the sight of your majesty be acceptable unto you, and through your mercy be effective to myself and all of those for whom I have offered it, through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Almighty and merciful God bless you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Beginning of the Holy Gospel according to St. John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him, not one thing came into being. What has come to being in Him was light, and the light was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, that all might believe through Him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light, the true light which enlightens everyone who's coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and so people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or the will of flesh, or the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh. And lived among us, we have seen his glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and of truth. This long, it's like, <laughs> there's like there's like five can of different masses in here. She thought we had to go through all of this every Sunday. The girl was terrified. Uh, so we're only doing one, just one, not the five out here. But we will be starting to use this um, in, in August. And then the other light part of story I want to share with you is we had that um, uh, the movie night on Friday. And if you haven't seen Spotlight, see it. Honest to God, you go and see it. And it's not about bashing any church. It's a positive message about one of those 72 disciples we talked about for the past two weeks. We have a responsibility as church. When you give all the responsibility of church to a few, and I don't care how good those few are, you're inviting trouble. And when you watch that movie, you, you get so angry at what was done in the name of church. We have a responsibility, and that's why we're a democratic Catholic church. Go out and see that movie and see why it's so important that we are a democracy and then live that democracy. Um, but it was kind of cool, like I said, Alice was at the first mass and her neighbor is the, her, the Alice's neighbor's cousin is the wife of the guy that Michael Keaton played. And he's one of the main guys, he's the editor of Spotlight. And so she pointed out that in the movie when they're at this Red Sox game, they're all in these seats, and there's a guy that's on the other side of the aisle, and he's uh, just watching the game. He's got a Red Sox cap on. That is the actual editor from the Boston Globe, who is Alice's neighbor's cousin's husband. <laughs> <laughs> he is the guy that was really the one uh, in spotlight that, that you know did all of that, organized all of this investigation, um, and so that you can see him there. And so the cousin uh, was able to point him out, and uh, we because we had that movie that night. Uh, Sharon and I just went out for a quick bite deep. We went over to Sugarloaf Frosty, and the line of traffic heading from Hadley and Amherst uh, over you know, down 116 to get on um, onto 91. It was a continuous line for 
you know, we went there, we, we cut through the line, it was already started, we ordered our meal, waited for that, ate our meal, and the line was still coming. And I give them a lot of credit. Those were all the Jehovah Witnesses that were having their convention up at UMass. The line was unbroken. So the lighthearted part is, next year, when they're holding their convention, and they're stuck in line, we're going to go down to that four-way intersection in Sunday. We're going to have holy name of Jesus pants us. And when they can't get away, we're going to go to Yeah.